let's kick it back over to Josh for a panel. Ladies, thanks very much for uh, joining me this afternoon. Good afternoon, and uh, yeah, welcome to the Good Lawyer Summit. I'm looking forward to sharing the spotlight with some other people here for a minute, bring my uh, blood pressure and heart rate down a little bit. Um, just to kick things off, I know Adil has uh, introduced you guys briefly, but why don't we go around the horn here and I'll ask you just to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about how your practice has evolved um, either to support or uh, contribute to this world of uh, mental health within our profession that we're talking about here. So um, why don't we start with Amy? Hi, Josh. I just caught the tail end of your um, presentation, so I'm going to have to go back and watch it. Um, but I appreciate you being so um, honest. Um, so my name is Amy Grubb. And I started my career on Bay Street. I worked in big law for a little over 10 years. And I decided to go out and go solo. I practiced uh, corporate commercial law with my own virtual firm before being virtual was a thing. And I had a lot of lawyers reaching out to me and asking me about how to build a practice like that because I was very happy as a solo practitioner. And so I no longer practice law. I'm now a full-time legal consultant. I own my own business and I help lawyers to go solo. And I also help small firms in order to build more profitable practices. So just supporting lawyers and helping them find more joy in the work that they're doing. So I thank you so much for having me. That's fantastic. Uh, Pauline, over to you. Thanks, Josh. Uh um, yeah, so my name is Pauline Chan. Um, I'm a lawyer practicing as a sole practitioner. Um, I'm also a co-founder and fitness instructor at Bar West, which is my uh, side hustle, I guess. Uh, and I'm also a mom to two young boys. Uh, I began my career um, in big law as well. Uh, I was there as a summer student, articling student, and then an associate eventually. Um, I ultimately left the big firm uh, due to mental health issues that I didn't realize even at the time that how I was feeling is not normal um, and was actually uh, telling me that there was some problems, mental health problems that I was needing to deal with. So after I left the firm, I worked as in-house counsel for a period of time and then sort of in an attempt that I now know was in an effort to improve my mental health. I ended up working part-time as uh, contract legal counsel so that I could pursue other entrepreneurial interests like the fitness studio and uh, also have a family. So I'm excited to speak on this panel and thanks for having me. Yeah, well, we're pleased to have you, Pauline. Last but certainly not le least, uh, Lorraine, welcome and uh, give us your intro, please. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I just want to say that about 20 years ago, I wish Good Lawyer would have been here when, when I set up on, on my own practice for similar reasons to what um, Amy and Pauline have said. I started out in a national firm and um, it was there late 80s, early 90s. And ultimately, um, I had two children while I was there and I was worked on a reduced hours arrangement, but it was obvious to me that I, that couldn't go on. It was intended to be temporary and I wanted something different. I ended up getting to be part of a job share in a multinational company, which was a really cool, um, cool, cool, cool thing. They really valued being able to offer innovative arrangements. So that was wonderful. Things changed. Then I set up on my own. It was sort of a practice where I was doing um, human resources laws is, 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 what my niche had, had become. And I did that when my kids were school age, because there were so many things going on that they um, needed, you know, in the after school time. But I reached a point where I was feeling quite lonely and isolated, because that can really happen when you're working on by yourself quite a bit. So I, I, I decided I needed to get a job. So the, I, I took a job at the Law Society, because it was available, and it sounded interesting. And I, I ended up designing their early interventions program, which was really looking at how lawyers were doing, you know, in, in terms of the kinds of things that were causing problems for them. But then when the opportunity of assist opened up, it was just sort of a combination of the, um, the things that I really wanted to do and to really be in a position to help lawyers as, as early on as, as, as possible. Um, I, 
I, I really think that as lawyers, we are intellectual creatures and we need to present a lot of evidence-based information about mental health issues because you know, it, it's, it's, the, the, the lawyers can be a bit resistant to something like that that's a bit softer. So um, I really, my, my, my aim in life these days is to decrease stigma and shame associated with lawyer mental health challenges. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got through the intros. So thanks again to all of you for being here. I'm going to start the conversation here with one of the, e the questions that I sent you guys through email. And Amy, I saw that you floated this out into uh, the LinkedIn network today. So let's start a conversation off here. And I invite you know, anybody to jump in here that, that has a, a thought or feeling about it. But I want to start us off with just this question. Is mental health different for lawyers than the rest of uh, the rest of working professionals. The reason why I, I uh, posted it on LinkedIn was because I didn't know the answer. So I was hoping someone would give me hmm. a really great answer. But um, in in my opinion, I think that lawyers, in for the most part, we're always helping other people. We're always helping to solve other people's problems, and so who then helps the lawyers. And so I think there is, at the end of the day, I think that there is a bit of a difference for lawyers, but at the same time, we all come with it with our own unique circumstance. So just because we're a lawyer doesn't make us any different from anyone else. Um, but the nature of the job is, it's, a, it's definitely a tough job, uh, depending on your practice area as well. So if there are law students on here who are thinking about different practice areas, you may want to think about what that looks like. So I've worked with quite a few family lawyers who are done with litigation. They don't want to be dealing with spouses who are fighting and trying to, you know, put the children up um, you know, as a negotiating point. And so they've changed their practice so that they're no longer going to court. So it's just, you know, different things um, to think about when you're going into the legal profession and also when you're in it as well. Lorraine, you sent me um, a great slide over the weekend that um, I think is part of your assist material. So maybe you can pick this up. I'm sure you have some thoughts about how mental health is different or maybe the same for lawyers and, and the rest of the public? Well, I, I did spend some time thinking about this and my first reaction to, to, to the question is that um, sometimes w w when lawyers look at things, we, we have a little bit of a, I'm going to use the word nar narcissistic perspective and thinking that you know, as lawyers, we are special and, and unique. Um, and, and we are an ego-driven profession. We're driven to success. So that's not totally, totally surprising. But, um, I, but I think the actual issues that lawyers face are the same. Um, the issues may be more intense because of the stress that lawyers face and the very high expectations and our absolute feel of fear of failure because we've been taught that failing and mistakes are, 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 are bad, bad things. But once you peel a few of the layers uh, uh, back, we really have the same general issues, depression, anxiety, burnout, relationship problems, substance misuse. Um, we have lawyer 12-step groups in Alberta. I'm pretty sure these groups exist in, in other provinces. I know we have people from across Canada, which is wonderful. But a lot of the 12-step groups will say, no one is unique and no one is special. When you have an addiction, you are addicted to that substance. And it's the general healing um, that, that happens, but you're not special because you're a lawyer as opposed to a maintenance worker. So um, I think that the issue that I really see in terms of lawyer mental health that may differentiate lawyers from other people is that lawyers defer seeking treatment longer. And, and Pauline, alluded to that and we see it all the time and that's partially because of shame and stigma and we some of us aren't very knowledgeable when we're practicing law about me mental health um, issues but it works against our recovery the longer we wait before we seek help um, general rule is, is, is that the sooner that you can get help for a problem the more easily it's resolved so what we see now and the pandemic has just made it worse is a lot more lawyers who have multifaceted issues 
and that are more deeply ingrained, meaning that it's going to take longer to resolve. So that's my convoluted answer to your question. No, thank, you. thank you. Thanks for your thoughts on that. Uh, Pauline, let's give you a crack at this same one. And then, uh, Lorraine, you just mentioned a thread there that I think I, I will pull on as we move forward here, and we'll maybe just talk a little bit about how um, pandemic may have exacerbated or uh, just kind of shone a light on things in a way that maybe was not the case before. But before we move into that, Pauline, um, what's unique about mental health for lawyers or maybe not so unique? Uh, so I would say I'm, I'm with Lorraine when she says that, you know, I think the, the general uh, issues, I suppose, when you peel back the layers, depression, anxiety, um, those things are not different. But I do think that, unfortunately, the, um, the big law environment, and I think maybe more generally, even as a profession, we tend to sort of normalize uh, the, an environment that's not really great for mental health and doesn't doesn't promote seeking help for it doesn't teach um, teach any of us what it what this these issues start to look like and how we can recognize them these issues are starting to affect us when we're working or in our you know day to day life or whatever it may be so I I think the issues themselves are, themselves are not different, but I think as a profession and maybe the certain working environments like big law really contribute to it and, and make it worse. So it's like I was saying to Lorraine earlier, I didn't even realize that when I, one of the associates in my group had, had gotten into a serious um, accident, was injured in the hospital for a month, she couldn't work. I talked to her and I remember telling her that you're so lucky, I wish I could be just just as injured so I could be in the hospital so I don't have to work. And she said, I actually feel pretty good about this in some ways. I'm in a lot of pain and all this other stuff, but I actually feel okay knowing that I don't have to be at work. And neither of us realized at the time that this isn't normal. These things that we're thinking and talking about, not okay. But, you know, for us, it's like, well, this is the only way to get out of work. I mean, vacations won't do it. No other way will do it. So I guess injuring ourselves to be in the hospital is the way to do it. So you know, and this is, I mean, this is a little bit of time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. And to me, neither of us recognized that this was an issue that we needed to address. So I think, unfortunately, the environment and the profession contributes to it a little bit. Um, that makes it worse, I guess. And in some ways, we don't know about it. We don't know enough to do anything about it. And then when we do want to do something about it, what does that look like for us? Does that mean we don't have work? Does that mean we get, you know, we're no longer a preferred associate to work with or whatever that that might look like yeah um so a couple of things there um the comment that you made about sort of normalizing things that should not be normal um that certainly resonates and you know that was very common sort of elevator talk uh, it was just really how normal it was to feel um sort of so beat down by the amount of work that you had or the pressures that you had in your in your day-to-day -day grind but you know, it's good to be busy and, and you just sort of shrug that off and, and get on with things. So I want to actually kind of combine a couple of different thoughts here, um, returning first to sort of this um, maybe change um, for the good, maybe for the worse around mental health and wellness in this COVID context, like Lorraine had mentioned. And I'll say that from my own perspective um, on sort of the normalizing um, feeling bad and normalizing, you know, uh, poor mental health and well-being because that's just part of the job. I can say that one positive impact that uh, the pandemic and COVID restrictions and lockdown had in my own experience while I was in the big firm at the time was that um, it was thrust front and center. The firm knew and management knew that, okay, people are probably struggling right now. And so while we may have paid lip service to or attempted in the past kind of token initiatives to address mental health, we really need to pay attention to this now because we don't have eyes on our staff and we know this was hard before we went into uh, our respective little hovels to, to do the practice. Um, so I'll just kind of open it up here. Uh, let's just have a little bit of conversation about uh, how COVID has maybe helped or hindered or changed the dynamic a little bit around this conversation. 
Amy, why don't you I'm take this I'm happy to dive into that since oh, yeah, I sure. sort of alluded to it. Sure. Um, I, I, one of the lines I've been using through the pandemic is that we're all going through the pandemic temporally the same way, but we're not experiencing it the same way. And I'm an introvert. Um, I've worked from home before and I kind of like it, but it's a very different experience for people who are extroverts and who need the buzz of, of being around uh, around people. So our, our journey hasn't all been the, the, the same. Um, I, what, what, what happened, you know, we, when, when the pandemic hit and from the point of view of, of providing counseling services to lawyers, um, March, of course, fell pretty much off, off the radar. And if you ever look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know how you have to attend to the more basic needs at the bottom, like security, food and shelter. And so March and April, our counseling numbers were, were way, way down. Yet part of me thought, oh, lawyers, you know, they're going to be reaching out for help because here we are in this pandemic. But I hadn't really um, re realized that people weren't able to focus necessarily on their own well-being at, at that point because the, there were so many more basic things going on, like caring for your children and, and, and trying to work. So I think there's been a range of experiences. What's been good about it is that I've heard of a lot of lawyers stepping back or viewing this as a time that they can step back a little bit in terms of why was I doing what I was doing? I was spending a lot of time commuting, then I was at work, you know, go back a bit in the evening, whatever it was, it's allowed people a little bit of time to um, to think about whether they're happy with what they're doing. Um, there are other people who've just been on the hamster wheel, churning away as many hours as, as possible and never knowing that they're able to have boundaries. So that would be another huge issue that I see, particularly for the junior lawyers, is everybody's working different hours. So if you're getting you know, texts or emails at 10 o'clock at night, are you still supposed to be answering them? I haven't heard of any organization telling people that it's okay to clock off. And I would think that that would be something that would be a really important wellness strategy is to say, you know, if, so, if there's something that's truly, truly urgent, somebody would phone you, but you don't have to be looking at your work email because it doesn't need that, that sense of urgency, but that flies in the face of the business model. So lots of different things. I think after the pandemic, there will be a lot of analysis but but there are positive things in that people are doing you know what what Pauline did thinking about is this actually what I want when I have a, a little bit of distance from it. Yeah, awesome. So uh, I'll admit when I tend to think about this stuff, I I generally think of it through um, the big firm context and the responsibility of the management and and the law firm to look after its employees. But um, Amy, let's maybe go to you and see from your perspective your clients and the and the types of lawyers that you're helping to create their own practices how were they affected um, through covid and and how did that change the way that they were managing their mental health and well-being well and i also want to touch upon um the pandemic as well i really resonated with your slide josh where it said it took a pandemic because i've had many, many lawyers reach out to me who have said, okay, I've had all this time at home, I've had time to reflect and pause, and I don't want to be doing what I'm doing anymore. I want to have more freedom and flexibility. I, you know, I want to do more things. And so I have seen a lot more lawyers decide to go out on their own um, and just take charge of their career, which I don't think they necessarily would have done before the pandemic. So in terms of your question, um, lawyers who were solo before the pandemic hit. So at the time when it first hit and things were going off the rails, um, people were really looking for community and support and to talk to people. And everyone's in a different situation. Some people have had kids at home all the time. Some people were totally on their own and didn't have anyone. You know, other people were living with aging parents. And so everyone had their own situation. And so I run a, a Facebook community for Canadian female solo small firm lawyers. And I started doing, I think it was weekly or maybe monthly. I think it was monthly calls where we just come together and it was just, let's just check in, let's just talk to each other. And so I saw a really big increase in people wanting to 
build a community, um, have some sense of connection, and um, also figure out what the heck are they going to do with their practices. And so I've seen and I've helped lawyers pivot their practice, um, reaching out to past clients, letting them know how how they're practicing during COVID. And so now we're kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, people have been a bit creative, but most of the solos that I'm working with are very, very busy right now. So um, the pandemic at first caused a lot of craziness and now it seems to be settling down a bit and people can really um, anticipate what's going to be coming um, from a financial point of view um, looking forward whereas before it was really hard for them to do that yeah great uh pauline any any thoughts and maybe in your own practice um, how you kind of adjusted um within the covid context and i know uh, we actually connected with you as as one of our you know top good lawyers within this COVID context, so you know for us um, that was a fantastic thing, and and certainly um, we've been able to connect with I think a number of lawyers across Canada in a way that maybe we would not have been able to in the same way without sort of that impetus of lawyers looking for oh shoot the world shut down how do I go out and uh, build a practice and meet clients and that type of thing. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience in this context? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think it's kind of funny. I, I, I think Brett was posting about this recently, but I had said to him specifically, I, I feel like I have been waiting for good lawyer my whole practice life. And now I literally separate my practice into before good lawyer and after good lawyer. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of funny. I've been looking for this for something like Good Lawyer for so long. And I I always just knew that for me, part of um, what I needed for my practice was um, options and the freedom to sort of work where I want to, how I want to, when I want to, um, so that I can juggle all of the other things in life, which part of which is my other business and the kids and things like that. Um, I mean, it's, I, I mentioned this before too, I'm no expert. I understand there's something such as decision fatigue and, and I'm gonna add, like I mentioned, life fatigue to that. So being able to work remotely through a platform like Good Lawyer and then having COVID happen, which sort of brings the rest of the world onto the boat of working remotely is not a terrible thing. It's just, it's it's been around for, the option to do so has been around for a while. It's just that, the pandemic sort of forced everybody to jump on board and do it um, the vast majority of the time for this whole during the pandemic. So it sort of got everybody else catching up and then it became sort of more normal that, you know, you could work at different hours and that you could just log in, do what you needed to and then jump back on later or everybody's on virtual calls all the time. This is not, it's not actually necessary to meet in person for certain things. Um, it just made, it just normalized it for me. And so it just made it so much easier for me to switch over my practice to a platform like Good Lawyer. And doing so has for me, and I would think um, other lawyers, really removed a lot of stress and, and decision-making and pressure to juggle all of the things around, all of the schedules around family logistics. So, you know, classes, lessons, sports, you know, juggled with work appointments, meetings, doctor appointments, things like that. Um, early on, yes, it was more stressful because the kids are at home and now trying to juggle that is a little bit of a, is problematic. But even then, it was easier to do so through something like Good Lawyer versus the way I was practicing before. Yeah. Awesome. So there's a few things that, you know, I think each of you kind of mentioned that actually sort of resonated with me while I was practicing in this context. Um, you know, I would describe myself maybe as an introverted extrovert. So I certainly did miss, you know, that ability to interact with my colleagues and to be around people on more of a day to day basis. But on the flip side, you know, having this uh, flexibility to work from home and being able to just, you know, turn my laptop down and know that if something really blew up, someone would call me and, you know, I'm right there. I can, you know, I can switch from cooking dinner or having a workout, which were things that, you know, didn't really exist so much in the sort of uh, normal practice life and I could come right back to it. So those are kind of positives, I guess, for, for me and sort of that evolving um, 
COVID world. I want to change gears a little bit here um, because of the demographics of our, of our panel here. I think it would be a huge miss from my opportunity not to give, uh, from my perspective, not to give you guys an opportunity to um, maybe speak a little bit to some of the unique challenges about being a female, uh, a mother in the practice of law, whether we're talking in the big firm context, whether we're talking in the remote context, the types of clients uh, that you're working with, Amy, and you know, a, a solo practitioner like you, Pauline, uh, I'll just kind of open it up and uh, maybe we'll sort of go in reverse order. We'll, we'll start with Pauline and, and hear your thoughts. So oh, yeah, I think um, for me, what I've sort of discovered uh, over time is that I think practicing part time for me is the best possible option, um, just so I can juggle the other things. And it really just, it sort of puts a bit of a cap, I suppose, on the anxiety and stress and pressure that comes with um, law practice. So for me, having the ability to work part time really helps with that. And because of that, um, at the end of a day, I actually have energy and patience, lots and lots. Well, I wouldn't say I have lots of patience, but it's needed lots. I need to have a lot of patience for the kids. So I, I just know that the practice, the way it was for me at, at um, in big law, was just not conducive to having a good family relationship. Um, I always tell people I was divorced once before. Um, my current husband when I when we got married, I had said to him, I actually really do like you and I would like to stay married to you. And I just don't think big law is going to work for that. So we're going to have to find a way around it. Um, so I, I think it plays, I think it's a huge factor. Unfortunately, I think um, gen very generally, I think women still take on um, a lot of the family uh, household work around, um, especially once you start having kids. And I think that there needs to be a rejig of that generally, but aside from that, uh, the profession does definitely, it makes it that much more difficult, I think, to juggle being a mom, being a parent, um, and home life with being a lawyer. If it's only the traditional model that's available, I've said this before, my perspective, looking around the big firms, you're only able to have a family if you get a nanny, and that's it. And there's nothing wrong with that, but, it may just not be what you want. And if that's not what you want, there's really no way around it. And unfortunately, you look around also, and it just sometimes seems like there's um, not, it, this starts to create problems in relationships, whether it's with your spouse, with the family. And I just think that there, a, a lot of that ends up, it, it felt like a lot of that was on my shoulders. And that if I didn't fix something for myself, it would end up showing up um, in bad relationships with my family and with the kids. Yeah. Amy? Oh man, I don't even know where to start. So I'm actually reading this book. Um, it's called, I think it's called The Lazy Genius Way. And uh, so she talks about how to build routines and things into your life. She has a podcast, it's really interesting. Um, but she talks about living in your season. I was just reading it last night and like, Right now, my season is bonkers. Like I've got three kids, work full time. It's a pandemic. Like, and but I'm learning to just embrace it, and I'm learning to ask for help. So I will ask friends or neighbors or you know my spouse or whoever for help. But um, it's an interesting book, and you just kind of have to accept where you are, and then you you move on to the next season of your life. Um, in terms of the clients that I'm working with now. You know, the really important thing for them in being able to go solo, I work with a lot of female lawyers um, and they worked in big law and it was crazy and they didn't have time to do, you know, to go to their kids um, recitals or things or they'd have to be on their phone the whole time. But once they've gone solo and they're their own boss, so they pick and choose who they want to work with, when they want to work, they can actually take a vacation and go on a vacation. And so it just allows for lawyers to have more freedom and more autonomy and more flexibility. And um, that's why I really like the Good Lawyer platform for solos, because it helps lawyers to pick and choose when they want to work. They can turn their availability on and off literally with a button. And it just allows for 
lawyers to have more control over their lives. And you don't have to even, you know, as a solo, you don't have to explain to people why you're not available. You don't have to tell the managing partner you're not coming into work. It's your business. You can do what you choose to do and you can turn it on and off as you please. Lorraine, I want to squeeze in one other question here and then I'd, I'd like to end on kind of a, a bit more of a proactive note where, you know, maybe we'll share some of our tips and tricks here for how we s can sort of manage our own uh, mental health and well-being. But Lorraine, I have kind of a, a hardball question for you here. Um, can we ever really make meaningful gains with respect to mental health and well-being in our profession without structural changes to the practice of law? So dealing with things like the billable hour and addressing, you know, for me, which, you know, I frankly, I couldn't not really get over, which was fundamentally the adversarial nature of our profession. So can we make meaningful change, meaningful gains in mental health without addressing some of those structural f forces? You know, I think that we start out, we're at a level right now where individuals are making changes to have positive impacts on their, 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 their mental health. And we're seeing people who have opted out of what a conventional model is, which is you work at a large firm and um, there's a certain amount of work that's coming in and you have a certain amount of prestige and all, 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 all kinds of, of things. Um, but some people appear to thrive in that model. We, uh, there are, I would say, more people who don't thrive in, in that model. So we have the problem that we have people who are saying, well, this is a perfectly good model and it works for me. So, you know, anyone who doesn't like it, well, I guess that's a personal choice. Um, unfortunately, the model that we have, um, I, 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 if you look at the, the model, I think it arose in the like the 1950s and 60s, and it worked for lawyers who had this wonderful support person at home called a wife who took care of a whole bunch of things for them. And um, I think women lawyers do have a different experience, and I think Amy and Pauline have really hit on that. But the model hasn't evolved, and instead, <clears throat> we have people working crazy and crazy crazier hours, you know, to, to, to get ahead. So, um, and the, the problem that we have is that we're told from very early on in law school, the students are told that these are the jobs that you want. This is what success is. It's working at a, at a big law firm. And there's actually research that shows that when law students enter law school, they have about the same rate of depression as the general population. And there's a shift and about a third of them have suffered depression by the end of first year law school. But there's also been a shift where they lose their internal motivation and the reasons that they wanted to go to law school to make the world a better place and to help people. And it's replaced by what they term appearance values. So what are your grades? Did you score an interview with important firms, your car, your house, all of those things that, that, that flow out. So I personally, I believe we have to go back to law school and the early days and ensure that students are getting a balanced exposure um, to what opportunities are, are, are like. And some people may choose to try the big law model, but we really do have to look at it from an, e an EDI perspective because it appears to work for a narrow section of the population and not so much for people who have a little bit more diversity and I'm including women in, in that. So. Uh, the, the problem that we've got is there's no way of forcing change. The people who are, are there working long hours and making a lot of money, some of them think it's, it's a great system. So I think what we need to do is empower and educate lawyers and law students about the wonderful opportunities that they can have if they value themselves and having time to feel like a whole human being and not just a paper cut out of a lawyer. I guess you can tell where my bias is on on, on, on this. So I, I really think it's an education process and um, we have to show that the brass ring isn't really what it is. The expression I've been using is that there's a platinum ring and the platinum ring is having a legal practice that you feel good about the work you're doing, you're making enough money to satisfy your needs and your life is balanced as a whole. So. Not sure if that answers your question fully, um, Josh. I think we, we need to make some changes, but I don't think we're going to change that model. They're, they're just, they're just, it's just too entrenched and it's working for people who are in the power structures. 
Yeah, thank you for that, Lorraine. I think you and I share certainly a, a similar bias in respect to that and you know some of that research that um, you're citing there talking about you know how early in the process at law schools and that type of thing is kind of changing our conception and the way that you know we wanted to approach the practice of law and that type of thing that's exactly my story and when I kind of uncovered that research uh, you know in the process of preparing for this that like really really hit home with me the next time we do this, I would very much love to have, um, you know, some representation from big law because it's a bit easy to make a straw man of them here where they're not a part of the conversation. But, you know, my general feeling is uh, similar. We won't have meaningful, um, meaningful evolution and uh, gains with respect to mental health and well-being in the profession unless we're addressing some of those structural features and you know each of the three of you play you know a really important role and have uh, kind of moved out of that structure seeing that it was not going to change and found other ways to you know use your legal practice and your legal education to kind of add value and and still sort of leverage those skills that you've developed um we've got about five minutes left here in our conversation and like i said i i do want to end on a, a bit more of a kind of a proactive and, and lighter note. So maybe we'll start with you, Amy, and could you just speak to, in your own day-to-day, -day, um, what are some things that you do that you focus on to sort of uh, prioritize your mental health and your well-being uh, with you know this very busy life that you have going on, uh, consultant, lawyer, mom, wife? What does that look like? Um, I... I also want to point out um, a Facebook group that a lawyer started. Uh, Tanya Parker Wallace uh, has a Facebook group called Lawyers Mental Health Support, um, which is a great resource for any lawyers who are interested um, and need some more support. I also listen to a lot of podcasts, um, the Happy Lawyer podcast by Catherine Scherer. She's a lawyer in Guelph, I believe. Um, it's, it's a great podcast to listen to as well. Um, Personally, I try and get away um, maybe once a quarter all by myself. Um, I'm fortunate to have a cottage in the middle of nowhere and I go sometimes for the whole weekend and I don't talk to anyone. I don't do any work. I just read books and sit by the fire. It's wonderful. Um, I also ask for help from people and I don't always hang out with lawyers because I find sometimes we kind of talk lawyer talk and it gets depressing and so I hang out with a lot of people who are not in the legal field um, and then lots of exercise and fresh air as well. Awesome I like that. Pauline over to you. Uh, so for me I guess it's two main things um, mostly on a day-to-day -day basis I, I find I really need to focus on on sticking to the basics so that that's the typical sort of stuff where you're talking about, you know, making sure you drink enough water, eating healthy, eating at regular intervals, exercising. Um, I think like, you know, you do your best on a day to day basis, but I think it's important to remember that this is sort of a this is a long term effort, really. And so, you know, I, I try really hard not to berate myself when I miss a workout or if I don't drink the water or if I'm just not eating. This all requires a lot of planning and, and thinking and organizing, but at, you know, but at the same time you do all this work, but at the same time, I just feel like it's important to be nice to yourself and just recognize that it's a long-term effort um, and not so much day to day. The other thing I think is really important that I try to do is I'm constantly looking out for um, why did I react that way? Why am I behaving this way? A lot of self-awareness and thinking about sort of where my triggers are, where the, you know, when I know that things are starting to go sideways. And then so I can, when I recognize that, then hopefully I can take the steps to avoid things going down into a deep, dark hole kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's an everyday sort of situation. And when you start to see that things are going sideways, then to ask for help, whether that's, you know, getting help from another lawyer, getting um, more help from my husband or my family for, for things, or if it's that I need to talk to somebody about it. Nice. 
And Lorraine, I'll reframe it slightly for you, and I'll give you an opportunity just to speak to some of the services, solutions, and support that ASSIST offers for lawyers to you know, help support the, the mental health and, and well-being journey. Oh, I'm happy to, t to talk about that. Um, and, you know, I know we have people from all across Canada and you have a lawyer's assistance program uh, where, where you are. Um, there's no uniform model. So it, you'll want to check carefully to find out what, what your, what's available in, in your province. Um, we are a pretty proactive one. So we provide professional counseling and they're registered psychologists with with at least 10 years of clinical experience before they're admitted into our program and they work extensively with lawyers and accountants so they understand the professional services firm dynamic and the common stressors and the terminology because nobody wants to spend half of their counseling appointment explaining what a chambers application is so um great if, if you can talk to some counselors who know what what the stressors are um we, we have a crisis counseling line too, which is really important 24 seven, you'll be connected to a psychologist uh, because we know that bad things don't only happen during the, the, the daytime. Um, we run a peer support program. So we connect a lawyer who's going through a, an issue with someone who's been through that issue or has insight into it. Um, we have some community groups now, which we started before the pandemic, but it was the turning out to have been a very good thing that, that, that we did. So we have a group called Parents Practicing Law, and we've got a webinar for them tomorrow on building you know, resilience and stress issues for lawyers and parents during the pandemic. We have uh, a mindfulness online group Tuesdays at noon, yoga Tuesdays and Wednesdays um, as, as, as well. And we're always open to whatever it is that, that, that people are, are needing. We, we have a coffee circle group that meets on Mondays at noon. And um, originally we were thinking articling students, you know, juniors, whoever, whoever needs it. And we've got a wonderful community. And I was pleased to see that some of our community members are on, on, on this event today. And it was just a place where lawyers could come and hang out. We've got some senior peer support volunteers. So if people have questions about how things work or how they could do something, um, we, we, we had that there. But it's, honestly, it's just a place where you can log in and and hang out in a non-judgmental, friendly setting. So we're, we're, we're trying to cover um, as much as we can in terms of healthy living, but feeling a part of a community can be very important. And Amy has mentioned a couple of um, great resources that I'm going to, 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 ch to check out, but isolation and depression are precursors, or sorry, isolation and loneliness are precursors to depression. So that's why we do a lot of the proactive things that we do. Amazing. Um, Pauline, Amy, Lorraine, Thank you very much for taking the time and having the conversation. It's a very important conversation, our profession to have, and uh, I wish we had more time. Uh, we're going to revisit this, obviously, in the future. Uh, as we conclude, I think what we're going to do is just with our production team is put up some uh, resources slides, actually, that were provided from Assist. So, uh, you know, take a screenshot if you're tuning in online here. Um, if you need help, ASSIST is there. It's a great organization. And uh, I'm going to pass it on here, I believe, to Adil to take over.